My name is Franklin Damon. Uh, I am a DPAA Laboratory Deputy Director. I oversee day-to-day -day operations of the uh, Nebraska lab as well as our small lab at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. Right, so the, yeah, the, 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 hit, the USS Oklahoma uh, is a battleship that uh, was capsized at the attack of Pearl Harbor. And uh, when that ship uh, capsized, uh, after the war, they determined that there were 429 uh, sailors and marines that died on that ship. The remains that were recovered for four years during salvage operations after that ship capsized uh, were buried in one of two temporary cemeteries in, in Hawaii. Records would be kept, bodies would be placed, identifications would be attempted, but it wouldn't be the official identification until after the war. When bodies would be exhumed, moved to a more permanent cemetery, records verified, identities verified. That effort um, identified 35 uh, individuals out of the 429. Uh, the rest remain, uh, remained as unknowns, uh, ultimately being buried uh, in the early 50s at the Punchbowl Cemetery uh, in Hawaii. The one thing that the crew members, uh, the ones that I did talk to, uh, had conversations with, uh, they were so proud to, to serve aboard the Oklahoma. They were so proud to uh, to be able to wear the uniform and, and serve. Of course, they didn't know what was going to happen on December the 7th. Billy James Johnson was born November 24, 1919 in Caney, Kentucky to William and Zella Johnson. He was one of nine children. His father worked as an oil driller and did other jobs during the Great Depression. The family moved frequently, living in at least seven states between 1905 and 1940. Billy enlisted in the United States Navy from Missouri on July 8, 1940. His first and only assignment was on board the battleship Oklahoma. He arrived on board October 12, 1940, while the ship was undergoing repairs at Puget Sound prior to returning to its home base of Pearl Harbor, where he was assigned to the ship's engine room. Details of Johnson's service are not known, but he must have performed his duties well as he steadily advanced in rate, reaching fireman first class on September 1, 1941. Johnson lost his life and his identity when the ship he called home for more than 15 months was attacked while it was moored at U.S. Naval Base at Pearl Harbor. Sailors on board USS Oklahoma awoke to a low morning sun, light clouds, and a breeze that Sunday morning. Some were sluggish from Saturday liberty, others prepared for religious services or looked forward to Sunday plans. Johnson, like many others, had recently sent home a Christmas card with a photo of himself in uniform. Just before 7.55, the ship's band and the Marine Color Guard gathered on the fantail in preparation for playing the national anthem and hoisting the morning colors. The daily ritual never took place. That morning, more than 350 Japanese attack planes launched in two waves from six Japanese carriers, initiating a surprise strike on Naval Base Pearl Harbor. The outboard ships, like Oklahoma, were the Japanese targets. In roughly 10 minutes, the ship was hit nine times. The damage was devastating as water, oil, and deadly debris engulfed Oklahoma's deck after each blast. As the ship rolled over, men jumped from great heights into the oil-covered water which threatened to ignite. Many were pulled under from suction and drowned from exhaustion. 
Crew members below deck fought to escape rapidly flooding waters and the crush of displaced materials. Disoriented by injury, darkness, and inversion, they desperately tried to get topside or crawl out of portholes. Many became entombed. While the torpedo attack ended around 8.10, a second wave of bombers arrived at 8.50 and continued sporadically until 9.45. Amid the second wave, members of Oklahoma's damage control team manned small boats and walked the ship's hull trying to locate trapped crew members. When banging was heard, holes were cut and rescuers entered compartments to find men clinging to life in air bubbles. 31 crew members were saved in the rescue operations with the last bin pulled out two days after the attack. In all, 429 Oklahoma sailors perished. Of those, only 35 had their remains immediately recovered and buried in Oahu Cemetery. The remaining crew members were trapped below the second deck of the ship when she capsized. The only ship to lose more men that day was Arizona, whose forward magazine exploded minutes after Oklahoma capsized, instantly killing over a thousand of her crew. Billy Johnson's family was notified that he was missing in action on December 21. His Christmas card arrived the following day. A month later, his mother wrote Washington for confirmation that her son was gone. I have waited and waited for some confirmation of my son, Billy James Johnson, as a casualty in Pearl Harbor. There remains a doubt in my mind, and I would greatly appreciate your giving me definite proof to the best of your ability that he is indeed deceased and are honored dead in the service of his country. The Navy officially confirmed his death and that he could not be recovered in February 1942. When the Navy assessed the salvageability of the ship's loss, it determined that Oklahoma had rolled into the harbor's main channel and needed to be moved. In the aftermath of the attack, U.S. forces obviously faced a huge task, not only of trying to recover the remains of those who died, but also in trying to salvage ships that had been damaged uh, during the attack. Salvage operations began in July 1942 and continued well into 1944. In the time elapsed after the ship sank, the remains of the sailors decomposed and began commingling. Salvage divers and medics faced the gruesome task of recovering the remains. The diving conditions were incredibly difficult, and when they turned on their lights to see underneath, it would just reflect back at them because there were so many oil droplets still in the water. So they were essentially diving in these wreckages blind. While the names of the missing were known, individual identification became impossible. Accounting for those lost was deemed as important as refloating the ship. They were able to make some recoveries of remains in the immediate aftermath. In the case of the U USS Oklahoma, however, the damage to that ship was so significant that the larger portion of unknowns that we now have today as part of the USS Oklahoma project were really recovered several years after the actual attack. Once the ship was patched and pulled upright, fuel and water were carefully pumped out, leaving just enough for the sailors' remains to float. The bulk of those remains that they did recover from the ship were recovered during those salvage efforts. And there's actually an incredible history to that salvage operation in and of itself, um, in that they were able to overturn this battleship um, with this incredible feat of engineering. And as they did that, and once it was righted, they were able to actually pump water out uh, and get into a lot of spaces. Once located, medics placed each sailor in a canvas bag. Then, each were taken above, placed in individual caskets, shrouded in an American flag, and brought ashore for burial at Halawa Cemetery. Chaplains held services on site twice weekly. A Marine Honor Guard steward watch on the ship until recovery operations ceased. A war correspondent was given a tour of the wreckage by a Navy diver shortly after the ship was righted. He encountered numerous human bones and left the ship rattled and unnerved. He described to Americans the feelings of violent death burned into his memory. In 1947, Oklahoma's unidentified crew were exhumed and taken to a lab near Pearl Harbor in an attempt to identify sailors' remains. With only rudimentary methods available, 27 possible identifications were initially made, but later rejected. Expecting reburial in group graves, the lab placed bones into caskets based on type, only to learn later that the military wanted them assembled as complete skeletons. But as it turns out, a higher uh, power within this structure decided that no, we don't want to do a group burial. A group burial was intended originally for smaller vehicles, like an aircraft. 
Meanwhile, however, they had actually segregated the remains into like elements. So they were trying to preserve how many caskets they were using, but in so doing, they ended up mixing up the remains even further. Remains were then reassembled as best they could be and placed in graves marked unknown in the newly opened National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific, located in the Punchbowl Volcano Crater. That year, Billy's mother, now widowed, attempted to have her son return to her. She was told that he was not identified and likely buried with his shipmates as an unknown. She died in 1952, never knowing the final whereabouts of her son. In the early 2000s, compelling archival evidence and advances in forensic science led to disinterments and positive identifications of small sample of Oklahoma's unknown. These disinterments revealed the scope of commingling and gave scientists a better understanding of future challenges. When the disinterments uh, happened in 2003, it looked like five individuals, but the DNA testing ended up revealing that we had almost 100 different DNA sequences. And so that just showed how commingled the remains were. It was at that moment where we kind of sat back and realized the real scale of the problem that we, that we had in front of us, or the, the challenge, I should say. In 2015, the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency worked with the National Cemetery Administration to exhume all of Oklahoma's unknowns from the Punchbowl Cemetery for comprehensive analysis at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. We did DNA testing uh, right away, we started and we sent almost 5,000 DNA samples for testing. There were over 13,000 bones that were inventoried as part of the Oklahoma. So a large amount of remains that we we're looking at um, and attempting to segregate into individuals and identify. As of November 2020, the POW MIA Accounting Agency has given back the names of 270 sailors using the most advanced technology available. Fireman First Class Billy James Johnson became the 200th sailor positively identified on February 26, 2019. His case highlights the complexity of the project as the fragments that made up his final remains were found in several different caskets. His descendants chose to have his remains interred at the Santa Fe National Cemetery, the place near where his family lived before the war and where his sister established roots. His return filled the family void felt for nearly 78 years. Family members from across the country came together for his final burial. A poem his sister wrote in grief after his death was read by his great niece at the funeral. Today we got the message and it filled our hearts with pain, for we grieve for our dear brother who won't be with us ever again. We didn't want to give him up, but he had just one life to give and he gave it for his country so that we in peace may live. Johnson is now at rest and is remembered along with millions of other veterans in the National Cemetery system. The National Cemetery Administration strives to ensure that none of the veterans interred in their cemeteries ever truly die, as their names and their stories will be forever spoken.